Until then, as with today's lecture, which we have moved online to this Zoom format, um, other exhibition-related programs are in the process of being reorganized to suit the non-congregating norms of our sad and difficult times. Before we jump into our lecture, which is titled Common Threads, I will share a few Zoom etiquette tips to ensure that everyone can hear the lecture, see the presentation, and importantly, have the opportunity to ask questions. First, please make sure that your Zoom line is muted. Check the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu screen for the microphone icon. This should be visible at the bottom of your screen. By default, your line is muted and you should see a red line going through the microphone picture with a text that reads unmute. Don't touch it. Please keep that line muted and do not touch the microphone icon. Second, please keep your video turned off. By default, your video and screen sharing is off already, and we would like to keep it that way. To the right of the microphone icon, you will see a video icon with a red line through it. Please keep that video sharing off and do not touch the camera icon. Third and last, we want your questions and comments. After the lecture, there will be a time for Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions during the lecture by using the chat feature. To submit a question, click the chat button in the middle of the lower menu area. Type your question and hit submit. We will address all questions and comments at the end of the presentation. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to first thank my friend, Woodmere family member, and scholar of the Bauhaus women, Sigrid Veltka, who introduced us to Jade Papa. In a short amount of time, I have come to understand that Jade is an amazing, passionate scholar, teacher, and curator. She is the curator of the textile and costume collection and an adjunct professor at Thomas Jefferson University, East Falls, which was formerly Philadelphia University. She has worked at the university for four years and teaches two courses, the history of costume and textiles and 20th century fashion designers. Jade has a bachelor of arts degree in theatrical design and production from the University of Northern Iowa and a master of fine arts degree in costume production for the theater from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Jade's current research area and lectures have focused on the mother of pearl button industry in Muscatine, Iowa at the turn of the 19th century. For more information about Jade's background, expertise, and current work, go to her website, jadepapa.com, J-A-D-E-P-A-P-A.com. Woodmere is looking forward to many other projects with Jade <laughs> and with Jefferson University. Um, ordinarily at this point, I would ask for a round of applause to welcome Jade to the podium, but we don't have a podium. So instead, I'm going to ask you all to clap out loud in the comfort of your armchairs at home. I am going to go down here to the reactions button and hit the clap icon, which I can see on the screen. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Jade. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. It is astonishing to see how many people are participating in this lecture. So thank you so very much. And uh, now you're going to not see my face anymore for a while. And I am gonna shift over to a shared screen where you will be able to see the presentation at hand that we are all here for today. Give me a few seconds to get this all loaded up. Okay. 
hopefully you can start to see my PowerPoint at this point and it's big on your screen. Um, so Bill has already covered a bit of this, but uh, I thought I'd start by providing just a little bit of context and say a few words about how this lecture came about. Um, so back in October, I was contacted by Hildy Toe, who is the curator of education at Woodmere, who asked me if I'd like to take a part, uh, be, like to be a part of the programming for their upcoming exhibition, Bullock, Searles, and Twin Seven Severin, African Philadelphia, 1960s to 2009. She had gotten my name from a mutual acquaintance who had just heard me speak at Jefferson. I enthusiastically said yes, and we scheduled a show and tell of African objects from the textile and costume collection for March 28th. This is, event was of course canceled, and unfortunately we were not yet able to find a time to reschedule it. But as I transitioned to this remote world we all find ourselves in now, teaching my classes and working online, I began to take note of what other cultural institutions and museums were doing to bring their collections to the public that could now no longer work, walk through their physical doors. And I thought to myself, we can make this work. I can still show a PowerPoint and we can use this magical system of Zoom. And thankfully the Woodmere folks were also on board. So that's how we find ourselves here today. And I have to pause and here say a, a, a really big thank you to Woodmere actually, because although it's extensive, the textile and costume collections non-Western objects are less utilized and less documented than maybe, maybe any other portion of our collection. Um, and this is, this is kind of unfortunate because they are a big part of our collection. Um, the, 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 class that I, the classes that I teach that Bill mentioned um, really focus on the Western world. So unless a student or faculty member requests them, our non-Western pieces just don't come out too often. So when I signed on to do a lecture at the Woodmere, I immediately turned to my collection assistant, Ann Wilson, who is listening here today, and I said, I uh, guess we better figure out what African stuff we actually have. So in January, she and I set about photographing and inventorying the entirety, well, at least at, at what we to believe to be the entirety of our African object collection. So far, we've identified 105 objects within our collection with African origins. And if you were watching the slideshow before we began our presentation today, that is sort of like a running thread of all of the African objects we have in our collection. So uh, without this collaboration at Woodmere, I, I really don't know when we would have gotten around to inventorying this collection. So thank you very much for the push in the right direction. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm just thrilled to, to look out on the participant list and see um, such a, a, a wide array of friends, family, colleagues, and, and just interested parties from around the country. And I realize that for some of you, this might be the first interaction with the textile and costume collection you're having. So bear with me a moment while I just take a moment to do a brief rundown of who we are, where we are, and what we do. So the textile and costume collection is located on the campus of Thomas Jefferson University uh, in East Falls, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, if you have driven past that part of campus, we are a white building set across the street from the main campus. You might recognize us from our lace fence that leads up, leads up to our building. But our holdings reflect um, a broad spectrum of design, cultures, and historic periods. The earliest items that we have in our collection are a group of Coptic textiles that date from the fourth century AD. The remainder of the collection dates primarily from the 17th century to the present with the majority of garments and accessories, as well as the Western and non-Western flat textile collection dating from the mid 18th century onward. 
We also hold objects related to the history of our institution and objects specifically related to the history of textile manufacturing in Philadelphia. So our collection is um, a study collection, meaning that more than being focused on exhibitions, um, we are an active collection that's utilized by students. And on this screen below an exterior shot of the design center, which is where the textile and costume collection is held, you see me in the black and white dress showing off two items of dress from the 40s um, um, to some students in my class. Students in my class. Is anybody else getting any odd feedback? I guess you can't answer me. It seems to have disappeared, so I'm going to hope that it went away. So as I was saying, you see me interacting with three students um, um, and an 1840s dress. So um, I use these objects in my classes um, to demonstrate what I would otherwise just have been able to show in two dimensions on the screen. And when I first met Bill over Zoom this week, uh, he asked me how many, how many objects do you have in your collection? And I said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Our best guess is currently that we have 50 to 100,000 objects. Nailing this number down and rediscovering the treasures in our collection has been my absolute privilege over the four years that I've been working at the textile and costume collection. I am not joking when I say that every, for me, every day is like Christmas. When I get to open a box that I have never seen the contents of before, it's it's just like a kid on Christmas morning. But I digress, back to the topic at hand. What you're going to hear me talk about today are highlights from our African object collection and my musings about how they correlate to pieces on view at Woodmere Art Museum. The focus, with a few exceptions, will be on pieces we hold from Western Africa. This corresponds to the artist's works that are featured at Woodmere, who are largely drawing on that area of Africa for inspiration. I just want to note one other detail that will serve as a through line in this presentation. This direction was inspired by a discussion I had a few weeks ago with Hildy Toe, so thank you Hildy, you didn't even know. And I'm paraphrasing here, but in speaking with her about how we are all physically separated um, as we try to slow the spread of this virus, um, she noted that we get through this by finding ways to connect with one another. So today is about making connections. Connections between the textile and costume collection and Woodmere Art Museum, connections within collections, connections with cultures, and of course, connections with those of you listening. And I have to admit <laughs> that connecting with you is partly self-serving. You see, a lot of my research into this African collection began just before we went remote. And much of my research was done at home, so thank goodness I had a few books to rely on. And while I'm thankful to have online resources, they will only take you so far. And those amazing books on topics related to collections are just taunting me from behind the closed doors of our local libraries. So I guess you could say that in reaching out to you, I'm crowdsourcing some of my research. But in thinking about this approach, it occurred to me that this is kind of always how I've approached things. And maybe it's my theater background where collaboration is the name of the game, but I, have, but I have always been of the mindset that it is bringing together the expertise of a vast, a vast swath of individuals that we gain the most. So although I'm learning more and more about our African textiles and dress, I'm not necessarily the expert in these fields, but I am the conduit that can connect the dots through research and get the right people together to paint a more complete object of these, uh, picture of these objects. So that is a long way uh, around saying uh, that I hope you can help me figure out what these objects on this screen are. <laughs> you see the details of the objects in front of you. 
these objects, um, uh, so the one at the top is, uh, the, the top image is the, the front, what we're calling the front of this stick, and the image below it is the backside, and then the object below those is a, a separate, obviously a separate object. So they're both part of a pair of like objects. We have two of each. Um, the wood on each of them has finished faces, uh, finished, are finished, and they have um, faces, figures, and snakes that have been shallowly carved into both sides of the objects. So the physical files that we have, the paper files, suggested uh, that these were weaving beaters. So weaving beaters would be used in the weaving process after the weft is passed through the shed to compact the yarns. But my research into the types of beaters that are being used in African weaving turn up nothing that look like these long flat sticks. I'm currently of the opinion that the object on top is a shed stick used to open up the warp yarns to allow the weft to pass through um, which is being demonstrated in the image of the man weaving on the right hand side of the screen. You can see he's grasping with both hands the end of a stick that has tapered ends um, and that looks very similar in, in some ways to, to our shed sticks or what I'm calling our shed sticks right now. I believe the uh, image at the bottom, the object at the bottom, um, uh, might be, with the prongs, uh, might be a shuttle, uh, but this one is even, even more up in the air potentially than the shed sticks. So I've scoured uh, online collections of museums, the Met, the Victoria and Albert, the Penn Museum, and many, many more, and I didn't turn up anything similar to anything that looks like these objects. So I'm really hoping amongst the weavers that I know are out there today um, that someone might recognize them, either having seen them in a book or a museum or their own collection of weaving tools and help give us some insight um, and make those connections. The image of the loom on the previous slide came from a really useful book I was thankfully able to access in its entirety online, which is called African Textiles and Decorative Arts, which if you can get your hands on it, definitely take a look. It's worth, it's, it's very much worth a read. This book, um, this book accompanied an exhibition at the MoMA in 1972 of the same name, and um, I made a startling discovery as I was reading through it. Flipping, or I guess more accurately, I should say scrolling through the pages, I was stopped in my tracks on the page featuring the hat you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Although it's noted in the caption, which I have transcribed here, uh, that it belongs to the collection of the Philadelphia Civic Center, after that museum closed in the early 1990s, the textile and costume collection become, became one of many Philadelphia institutions that absorbed pieces of that collection into their own. Until very recently, these pieces um, in our collection have been in a complete state of limbo, um, but I instantly recognized that hat from the book as being a piece that we now hold. And a little digging in our files led me to the picture you see on the right hand side of the screen and a listing of this hat in the official inventory we received when the Civic Center objects were transferred to us. Even better, the note in our inventory lists this object as having a Central or South American origin. So now as a result of this happenstance occurrence, it can be correctly inventoried and added to our African collection. The objects, the objects on this page represent a bit of a Cinderella glass slipper moment. Anne and I first photographed the bottle you see on the right, and I identified it as a Maasai drinking bottle. These bottles were traditionally filled with a mixture of milk and blood from the cows that are a part of the daily lives of these semi-nomadic peoples. We found the object on the left-hand side of the screen later on in a completely different box. Like the bottle, it's made out of a gourd and is decorated with brightly colored seed beads. And I thought, could it be? 
and dug the bottle out of the box and carefully slipped the cap onto its open end. It was a perfect fit. So while the accession numbers, which in theory tell us when the object came into the collection and the donor, and you'll see that the accession number um, for the cap is 1995.3.3, and the accession number for the bottle is 1984.42.20. Obviously, don't correlate at all. I truly believe that these objects belong together. It's possible that back when they were initially accepted into our collection, or sometime after they arrived prior to accessioning, they were separated from one another and given different numbers. In our inventory of African objects, we've discovered that we have a wide variety of objects, things like bowls, musical instruments, and the bottle you saw in the previous slide, in addition to textiles, garments, and jewelry. We also find that our collection is strong in regards to certain groups of people in Africa. So in this slide, what you're seeing are a few of our objects related to the Maasai peoples who live in Kenya or Northern Tanzania. So in imagining how this collection is used in the future, it is my opinion that having groupings of objects like these, instead of just one-offs, will give students and other interested parties a more, a more complete understanding of the daily lives, traditions, and aesthetics of people like the Maasai. It allows for a deeper connection. Woodmere, as, as Bill mentioned, Woodmere Art Museum has extended their exhibition to September 7th. So I hope when it's safe to do so, we can all take a trip there to view these amazing works in person. And as I mentioned, what you'll hear today are my, my musings on some elements that, like is the case in this painting by Twins 77, visually connect to objects in our collection. These connections might also speak to textiles that lived in the peripherals of these artists. In this case, Nigerian-born Twin 77 would have no doubt encountered Yoruban Adire Aleko textiles. <clears throat> and so when I look at this painting, and one of the four examples of Adire Aleko textiles we have in our collection, I see parallels in the way the plane of the respective canvases are filled with pattern and color. I'm also struck by the way the motifs give a seemingly layered appearance to the surface and create depth in a flat plane. Adire is a Yoruban word that means to tie and to dye. This resist dyed fabric is created by Yoruban women in Southwest Nigerian, Nigeria. Adire Aleko is one of a number of resist techniques practiced in the area, and it refers to a fabric that is painted with a starch paste and then dipped into a vat of indigo dye. Depending on the shade of blue desired, it's often dipped multiple times. After that shade is achieved, the starch is rinsed out and scraped off. Women paint the patterns, uh, which speak to themes like nature, religion, philosophy, everyday life, and notable events in the history of Nigeria. They paint these onto the cloth with chicken feathers, which is what you are seeing the woman doing in this wonderful Google Arts and Culture image, um, which I encourage you to all go check out um, after this lecture. You see her in hand, she has a chicken feather there. Um, although she might also uh, be using a palm rib or a metal knife. The starch that is used um, for the resist is usually derived from that of the cassava plant, although in recent decades, wax has also started to be used as a resist on these textiles. These pieces of cloth were traditionally worn by women as wrappers, uh, as wrappers which you can see an example of in the image on the left. It wasn't until the 1960s that the gender barrier was broken and certain groups of Nigerian men began to wear adire shirts. This shift might account for the patterned, possibly adire or at least adire inspired garments that the men in Charles Searle's relaxed traders are wearing. 
And I'm borrowing Searle's words here from some material related to the exhibit at Woodmere. Searle's, speaking after he returned from Nigeria and Ghana in 1972, said that one of the things that made the strongest impact on him was the people and amongst, uh, and specifically the way that they dressed. He incorporated these elements into his paintings. Barbara Bullock's Woman with Fish features a woman in a colorful wrapper, but not an Adire one. What caught my eye when I saw this image was the fish balanced on her head. In much of Africa, fish are a symbol of abundance and prosperity. The thought being that if there are fish, there is water. And it's no earth shattering revelation for me to say that cultures assign meaning to elements like color, pattern, or symbols that can be associated with dress. As a culture and over time, we, and I'm pointing to myself here, um, we have constructed the equation of things like purple to royalty, white to purity, a sideways figure eight to mean infinity, and the rose as a symbol of love. A much deeper understanding of Yoruban culture would be gained by, de by deciphering the symbols in the Adire cloth shown in the previous slides. Alongside the technical skills necessary to produce the tie-dyed cloth that are passed down from generations, or excuse me, through generations of women, an understanding of the symbols and what they mean is passed down as well. This adds an, uh, an additional layer to the significance of these pieces of cloth. They record in what seemed to us like dots and dashes, concentric circles and amorphic shapes, the history, stories and values of a people. And it is our task, or at least uh, it's our task to unlock, or at least to seek to understand these meanings. Fish have been a strong and stable trade commodity in Ghana dating to even before the colonial era. The coastline of Ghana along the Gulf of Guinea and Lake Volta provided a steady stream of fish. This and vast deposits of gold in this area made the Asante peoples very, very prosperous. In fact, many of the Asante objects we have are brass weights used to measure gold and gold dust. You'll see one of these weights near the end of this presentation. Stylized depictions of fish, which you can kind of see in the center of this textile. It's the long skinny fish there. So stylized depictions of fish are featured alongside hunters in the textiles you see in this slide. This Korhogo cloth was created by Sanufo men and named after a village in the northern part of Cote d'Ivoire. Again, we see the Sanufo using fish to symbolize vitality and abundance. This symbolism was even more significant to the Sanufo, uh, and particularly in peoples who lived in the drought-prone areas of northern Côte d'Ivoire, where food and fish could sometimes be scarce. The hunters, who are featured on either side of the fish in this textile, symbolize life's mysteries. So Korhogo cloth uses these striking images to tell stories, images like this and, and many of the others that um, are known to be used in Korhogo cloth. In an incredibly informative article in the African Journal of Applied Research, I was able to access online titled, Decoding the Symbolism of Bogolonfini, Korhogo and Fawn Fabrics. The process for creating Korhogo fabric is described as follows, quote, the woven cloth is stretched very flat on a board and secured by means of small pegs. Without any preliminary sketch, the designer traces the designs with his knife after having dipped it into the dye." Unquote. The substance this painter would be working with are derived from two natural sources, 
the sort of background greenish yellow, orangish yellow that you're seeing behind the fish and the hunters in this textile probably came from um, a substance that came from boiled leaves. And the darker areas are created from decayed swamp mud that is extracted from the roots of trees or it's obtained from a pool or muddy place in a stream bed. And in either of, the case, of these cases, the mud um, is allowed to ferment for up to a year. It's a, it's a fascinating process to read about. So while it is men who apply the dye and paint the images, it is women who prepare the dye for that process. So originally Korhova cloth, like the one that you see on the screen, um, were used for religious purposes. They were not worn on the body. And even now, um, they are largely used as wall hangings, but the patterns do find their way occasionally into clothing. So if you look closely at the fabric, the background of the, behind the painting of this Korhova cloth, you may notice that it's not one solid piece of fabric, but a series of eight narrow strips of fabric stitched together. And here I am showing you the back of that cloth. You can faintly see the outlines of the figures on the front of it. Um, but you can also see how um, in a machine stitch, those long strips of fabric have been sewn together. So although not a Sanufo man, the makers of Korhogo, this Guro man, an ethnic group also found in Cote d'Ivoire, shows the typical features of the horizontal looms that weave narrow widths of cloth throughout Africa. The weaver, um, who is here a man, but in Africa that is typically the case that weavers are traditionally and typically men, He's raising alternating sheds, um, sheds being the openings through which the weft yarns pass, by depressing one of the two pedals uh, you see at his feet there. And it's likely that he's using in both the warp and the weft of his fabric cotton, which is what I believe to be the fiber in our piece of Korhogo cloth. Outside of Africa, the most well-known strip woven cloth is kente. And even if you're not familiar with African textiles at all, you're likely to recognize kente as it has jumped into mainstream fashion and we often see it as part of graduation regalia, stoles that are worn around the neck. We have three examples of kente in our collection. So kente is made by the Asante or the Uwe peoples who primarily reside in Ghana. And again, the weavers are traditionally men. Most kente cloths, uh, cloths are named according to their warp patterns, the way the colors are combined. Um, although some are named for people, that's usually ends up being the rulers, trees, plants, birds, and animals. And then the strips are hand or machine sewn together to create large wrappers, cloths, or blankets. While not as well known as its countryman Kente, a dinkra cloth is also produced by the Asante peoples in Ghana. A dinkra cloth begins with a stamp carved out of a calabash, which is what you're seeing here. Sticks of bamboo or wood are then used to create a handle that extends from the back of these carved motifs. And if you wanna imagine the size of these stamps, they um, really fit into the palm of your hands. Um, so they're not terribly large. The carving is a job that's done by men. And the dye used to stamp the design on the fabric is created from the bark of a body tree. So the bark of this tree is broken up into pieces, soaked into, in water for about 24 hours, and then in what looks like a very labor-intensive process, is pounded in a mortar. Next, because we're not done yet, uh, next to prepare for printing, this pulverized material is repeatedly boiled and filtered into a concentrated solution. Men stamp the designs onto cloth in linear patterns. 
They work on long boards that have cocoa mats underneath to soak up the dye and provide a working surface. Historically, a dink rule was reserved for Asante kings. However, over the years, its use has expanded to the general population, men and women, who wear a dinkra cloth on significant occasions, the most important of which are funerals. And the word itself, a dinkra, if you break it down into its parts, d, ninkra, in the Akan language, that means to take one's leave. So in the context of funerals, it, rep it represents a person taking their leave of this world and passing into the world of the ancestors. Black, brown, red, or purple printed cloths are worn as wrappers during periods of mourning, while white cloths are worn on festive occasions. The small size of our textile, and you can see the dimensions of it there, and the color might indicate that it was made for the tourist market instead of actual use inside Ghana. Decoding the nuanced symbols of the hundreds of Adinkra symbols is usually only accomplished by well-trained artists and elders who, through study, are able to identify the names of many Adinkra symbols. It can be an incredible challenge for others to decipher them because not only do the symbols themselves have meanings and you're seeing um, the meanings of those symbols below the images of each of these stamps, um, but the way that these symbols are combined creates a narrative pattern and a more complicated message. So, whether looking at the work of Twins, Searles, or Bullock, featured in Woodmere's exhibit, I'm constantly struck by the impact of color, cloth, and pattern that permeates their work. And although I would consider the research I've done so far just a, a drop in the bucket, filtering my thoughts about our objects through the lens of those artists has opened up connections I might not have even thought to explore. This in turn allows me to connect these objects and their ever expanding definitions to students and faculty, researchers visiting our collection and our community at large, at large. and of course with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your time as we embarked on this whirlwind tour of the African objects of the textile and costume collection. And again, uh, I wanna say thank you. Um, my colleagues uh, are working now behind the scenes to furiously co collect um, any questions that you have that you wrote in while I was speaking. Um, so while they are doing that, I want to take a moment to say thank you um, to these lovely people named on this screen, listed on this screen, um, many of which you've heard me mention today already. Um, they helped me make this crazy idea to do a lecture into a reality. So truly to Anne, Liz, Patrick, William, Hildy, and Christina, I, I could not have done it without you. Thank you so much. And then again, uh, uh, I just want to take a moment, um, I've showed you images today, but I want to speak with you about how you can access um, both of our collections. So the Woodmere Art Museum makes it easy. Um, you can find the museum by going to their webpage, which you can see the address of it listed in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And you can also find them on Instagram at Woodmere Art. Um, so now to our collection. Um, while you can access the objects of the textile and co costume collection in many ways, there's currently not a centralized place to see everything at once if you are not associated with Jefferson University. But fear not, there are plenty of ways that you can see our collection. So we'll start at the top. Um, you can see a lot of images from our collection on our Instagram page, and that's where you can find us at the, in at the Design Center. You can also visit um, our website, Tapestry, and you can see the web address there next to the icon. Uh, Tapestry is a website that showcases our collection of fabric swatches, or if you'd like to see a collection of over 100 hand-carved wood blocks from the 19th century, you can visit Jefferson Digital Commons, and you can see the web address there. So if you are associated with Jefferson, 
Hopefully you already know this, um, but if not, I'll remind you. Um, you can see our entire collection by accessing the textile and costume collection on JSTOR. And if your institution happens to subscribe to JSTOR, you can also access that collection on there. And in some breaking news, um, I'm really happy to report that this week we learned JSTOR is gonna start publishing our collection to the public. So we're in the very, very early stages of figuring out all of those details. So stay tuned. And if you want to be amongst the first to find out when that collection goes public, um, please copy down the address at the bottom of the screen, um, the one that's below where it says sign up to receive um, updates. And, uh, and, and uh, if you go to that, um, put that in your web browser and enter in your information, um, I'll get an email and then I'll put you on our mailing list. And, and I promise I won't um, bombard your inbox with um, too many emails. Um, so at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to start my video again. And hopefully we've got some questions um, up and ready. So Bill, take it away. Um, well, hello everyone and, and thank you, Jade. That was amazing. And um, I, I really look forward to seeing some of these amazing fabrics and objects and stamps in person and you know at some point obviously not in the next weeks or so i hope we can plan a woodmere trip to you know right down henry avenue to visit you in person and um you know it'd be, it'd be great actually i think it would be a great field trip so um you know to everybody who's on this um on this call um you know, thank you very, very much. Um, just makes me want to see more. So we have a number of questions and I, I have the questions on my phone. Um, there's a question about the, um, the age of some of the objects that you've shown. And I'm, what I might do is generalize that question and ask you just to speak a little bit about the history of the collection. Um, you know, how did this collection begin? Why did it begin? And then maybe talk about, you know, when some of the objects that you showed us today came into the collection. Yeah, sure. So um, our university began in 1884 and it began as a school to train textile manufacturers. And so I think that we started amassing things, not in a sort of um, uh, a, a way that any was, anyone was doing it on purpose, but we started amassing things at that point. I mean, I have, um, we have in the collection workbooks and worksheets from students from the early 20th century, like 19 teens, like these are the weaving plans for students in this particular class. Um, so we have things from then. Um, our current space, right, um, the design center space was donated to the university in the mid 1970s. And so when we got that building and stuff that had been accumulated, accumulating for decades started to come over into that space and people started to know about us, um, people in the community, this is, these are the stories that I heard, people in the community would drive up in their station wagons and say, I was just cleaning out my grandma's attic and I found this, 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 and this. Do you want it? And we would, with open arms, say, yes, we'll take it. So all of the pieces that we have in the design center are donated by the kind people of East Falls and the surrounding areas. So it is truly remarkable to me to think about um, how we are preserving people's stories and people's objects and then passing them on to the next generations. Um, in terms of your question about, and, and other people's questions about the age of these particular objects, um, for some of these objects, we know who the donor was. For some of these objects, we have no idea who the donor was. They're, they're classified in our collection as found in collection, meaning we just don't know where they came from. But um, I'm trying to recall, I think one of those shed sticks, 
the accession number was the year was 1995. So it's likely that the African objects that we have are probably from the 20th century and prior to like the 1990s. Um, it would take a little bit more um, research to dig in to find out what specific years these objects are from. And, and the challenging bit is that um, because these are like traditional objects, the um, changes in them are more nuanced and happen more slowly. So sometimes it's harder to put a date exactly on them. So I hope that answers people's questions about that, at least. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very useful. So um, I have a question that is coming from Susanna Gold, who is the guest curator of Woodmere's exhibition. And I want to thank Susanna for a great show. Yeah. Um, and I want to read her questions. So, uh, and I was supposed to have cataract surgery through uh, the weeks of this crisis. So no. I'm going to have to um, work a little bit hard to see here we go. I think I got it in the right place so I can read it. Uh, many of Twins and Searles' textile-like passages are organized into regular bands or geometrically ordered patterns, especially when this reads as clothing. Some of Bullock's imagery conforms to this regularized repeated patterning too, but some does not. Often we see irregular splashes of color or unique non-repeating shapes on the clothing of her figures. Um, so the question is, is there an African textile precedent for this kind of aesthetic? And I assume, you know, it's the aesthetic of Bullock where there's not you know, a regularized pattern as we see in, in Searles and Twin 7-7. Seven seven. Uh, so, um, and just to make sure I'm understanding the question, the, the question is about like, is there a regularized pattern of that linear, linear line or, or not? The, the, the question is the non-linear pattern, okay. the non-regularized pattern is, where does that come from? Because it seems that that is what we get in Barbara Bullock's work. Sure. Yeah, well, I think we saw that a little bit in the Corhogo cloth, right? That with the Adinkra and, uh, and, and some of the other examples like that I'm thinking of, maybe the Maasai cloths that we have and, and textiles and accessories. Um, but that Corhogo cloth that I showed, the one with the hunters and the fish, really seems to me like a more of a painting, of more of a like thinking of the composition as a whole rather than in these like sort of read it from left to right and up and down and things like that. Um, so I think uh, the short answer and from what I've seen in my research is that there, depending on where you are in Africa, maybe when you are in Africa, both of those aesthetics live together, could live together. That's really interesting. And I have a related question and it has to do with Twin 7-7 who was an extraordinary draftsman. So people who knew him or were privileged to be able to watch him create, you know, any of his works of art, they describe that, you know, he would use ink and, you know, various brush-like or pen-like instruments to, you know, make linear patterns that on fabrics that he would dye or, um, you know, would color in, in various ways, sometimes brushing on the color too. And, you know, we've seen, you know, stamped fabric, we've seen woven fabric. Um, in the tie-dye fabric, we saw the resist um, process where, you know, the resist material would be painted on in linear patterns. But I'm just wondering, um, and this is vis-a-vis -vis an understanding of twins, um, you know, I, I never stop to think, or ask the question, are there examples in African, you know, West African fabric, Nigerian fabric, where the fabric maker is literally painting on linear patterns of, of designs, of figures, um, you know, often they repeat, but, um, you know, they aren't stamped. I mean, he's, he's yeah. drawing them with a brush. 
Well, it, it occurs to me that in those Adira Aleko textiles, you kind of have a um, conglomeration of both of those ideas that, um, you know, the, the width and length of the cloth is sort of divided up into, we'll call them what we've mostly seen are squares. So let's say there's like 10 squares going across the, you know, the width and then down the length, there's, you know, three sort of square boxes. And then within that, right, you, so, so that sort of the linear like quality of it, but it, it is maybe overshadowed in some ways by the, the, the details in those boxes, which are done largely by hand. Um, you know, that woman who was painting the Adire textile with the chicken feather has an idea of what that pattern is going to be in her head, but it's, it's very much free form. And, right. and there's yeah. some really wonderful um, videos on YouTube, or, or, and I think the Museum of African um, uh, History in uh, Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian, has some um, um, videos of these Adire Le Aleko textiles just being sort of like freehand painted. And it's a beautiful process to watch. One, because they're super fast at it. Um, but two, just because you get to see the, the way that it's not just, um, it has to be done this way. This is the way that we do it. There's some, I think there's some individuality in those squares. Well, that's so interesting too, because when people describe Twins' method, they describe that he was fast, that he was fearless, he began and would just keep going until you know a painting was finished. So that's really interesting to me. So there are there are many more questions, and I want to um, I want to get to them. Um, one of the questions is: um, uh, Will this be archived as a podcast so others can see it later? Will the video stream of the objects be available? Um, I see that the collection of Arthur Hall, distinguished teacher and dance artist, was added um, to the collection. That's at Temple University. Um, and so I'm just going to answer that and say, yes, we have recorded this um, lecture session, and we will put it up on Woodmere's website on what I call the splash page for the exhibition. So it'll be archived there forever. And um, I believe it'll be archived and you know made public also on the Jefferson University website. Um, so so that gets to that. But then um, the same person who asks that question is interested in dance and is asking about any connections between the movement of the body and dance in relation to the fabrics that you showed. Are any of those fabrics designed specifically um, for figures in motion you know, or dancers? Which of course is a big theme in the exhibition too. Yeah. Um, you know, when, you, when you look at the exhibition, figures are moving and they are dancing. Yeah, well, you know, I can't say specifically that any of them are used or were used in dance. Could somebody walking down the street hop a little skip and, you know, kick their heels up a little bit? Absolutely. And I think what's um, particularly the, the textiles that we see that I showed today, like the Adire Aleko, I mean, they're wrapped around the body. Um, for women, at least, in a way that you might uh, wrap a, a towel around yourself after you get out of the shower. So in a way, they do offer a lot of freedom of movement of the body. And um, on the very first slide, um, one of the items of dress that I didn't talk too much about was a very large robe. Um, and these uh, tend to be, these Nigerian robes tend to be very oversized, so allow for a lot of movement of the body. It's not the only reason they are of the size that they are, um, but uh, that's a fascinating connection and little rabbit hole to go down um, in thinking about um, ways we can open up our understanding of these textiles, for sure. Um, so here's a question. How tribal specific, region specific, or country specific in Africa are these fabric designs? Are there different styles of art in the making of design color um, created in the same area? So it's, this is about specific, specificity to region of these different fabrics or designs. Yeah, well, I think, um... As you might say with the, the sort of like Western world, 
um, now uh, and rings true in the African world as well as we have become, uh, you know, moved into the 20th, 21st century. Um, there has been, a, the, the world has become a smaller place, right? We're seeing influences of um, different peoples, like the, melsh, the meshing and the melding of, of um, imagery and colors and, and styles and symbols and motifs. Um, so I think maybe that's become a little bit blurred, but yes, I do think there's specificity. Certainly, if you go back to the origins of some of these textiles, when these peoples were a bit more um, separated either by choice or by geography or whatever that was, um, and then as they encounter one another, um, some of those meanings get absorbed, some of them get rejected, um, some of them are adopted by other people. But um, yeah, there is still, and I, I think based, again, this is just based on the research that I've done, some of the videos that I've seen, um, there's a great pride, uh, almost a resurgence of pride in, in keeping those traditions of how the textile, you know, how the textiles are woven, how that dye is created, um, the symbols that are used, protecting that for future generations, right? Because of the fear of that if we don't do it, if we don't pass these down, they do get lost and then no one can appreciate them. Um, I have a question about the symbolism of color in the kente cloth. And if you can elaborate, you know, on the significance of color. And then I will add to that, um, for specimens, for fabrics that are quite old, they don't seem to have faded at all. They seem quite vibrant. So I, I'd, I'd love you to comment on the meaning of color, but also the preservation of color in the collection. Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, when we look at color, when we think about like, how is this stayed so nicely, this color? Uh, it might go back to, to what I said at the beginning of this um, presentation today that um, the uh, ethnic textiles we have are some of the least seen. So if they've just been in boxes for four decades at this point and rarely come out and see the light of sun, that's probably helped preserve them. Um, but um, I would also be curious just from a sort of like personal standpoint of like, what is the composition of those dyes, right? I'm pretty, um, uh, I, I, I'm pretty certain that the dyes used in the Korhoga and the Adinkra are from natural sources, which is the ones that I described. But for those kente, you know, is that since, since we are, you know, dating these to the 20th century, is that, a, is that a synthetic dye or is that, you know, from a natural source? So getting it under a microscope somewhere and having a little bit of chemical analysis would be a good thing. Um, I, I know that there is a great deal of significance between, but behind the color, the combinations of color for Kente, um, that um, depending on the sequence in which the colors are presented, that tells a story, that speaks to an individual or a group of peoples. Um, you know, I know things like the color red, like it would for us, um, refer to things of blood, yellow, bright yellows, sunshine, brightness, happiness. Um, there's there's a great deal more. Um, it's something that um, we'll dig that you know we'll dig into for our research. There probably are people on here who could go into those details even more. But yes, it it's it all has meaning. It, it's just it's it's that point of having to unlock the secrets. Right, we are not of that culture. And so we need to immerse ourselves in that culture, or at least the research that's available to us about that culture to get a greater understanding, right? Again, it's, it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg that we've um, touched on today. Thank you. Um, here's a question about the loom that appeared in the very first slide that you showed. And, um, the the request is actually for more of an explanation on how the loom actually functioned and um, the person posing the question says that um, it looks like the fabric is being woven in the shape of a circle and um, 
I, I wonder if you can just speak to that. Right. So um, I'm, I'm going to assume that you all know this, but I'm going to explain it just in case we don't, that when you are weaving, you talk about two sets of yarns, the warp and the weft. So the warp yarns are the yarns in that image, if you recall it, that um, stretch out um, in front of, um, you know, sort of like perpendicular to that person. And then, uh, excuse me, uh, in front of that person. And then the weft yarns are inserted um, from the side. So what you're seeing and what made it look like um, a circle, um, oh, well, let me finish explaining and then I'll go back. Um, what made it look like a circle is that those are the warp yarns that are looped around the, um, the, the back harness, the harness at the back, and then where he is seated. So it is in fact a loop, but he is only inserting the weft in the upper portion of that loop. And um, so I think maybe um, uh, the question was regarding the loom in the first slide, like you said, and I just ignored. Um, where you have the um, vertical loom, because we do see vertical and horizontal looms. The horizontal looms tend to be the ones that are weaving the narrower widths, the vertical looms being the ones that are weaving the wider widths. Um, and so on those wider vertical width looms, again, it is the warp, and yes, it does circle like all the way around, um, and then just kind of a continuous loop, and at some point they are cut to get it off the, off the loom. So interesting. Actually, thank you for explaining that because I did not fully know all of that. So, so I, I appreciate it. I think we have two more questions. Um, this one, this is a question that has to do with the shed sticks, which were the very first things that you showed. Yes. And um, uh, it's a question about when they were made. And the questioner says that um, there's an assumption they were made in 1995 when they entered the collection. Um, and then there's the question, if they can't be definitively identified as weaver's tools, um, there's, a, there's a sort of musing, there's a wondering if they were made in the late 19th century or in the early 20th century as decorative objects for the safari trade oh. by a woodworker who also made utilitarian objects for um, the use of, of local weavers as well. Yeah, so that 1995 number, um, this, that's the accession number, right? It's this three-part number sure. that we give as a museum our objects so we can trace them through. So um, not necessarily that it was made in 1995, just that we officially inventoried it in 1995. So that's why I'm saying the the date is before that at some point. But that is a, that's a fascinating thought that that might have been made for like the safari trade because I mean I know one of the donors who donated a, a number of our African objects the, the objects she donated still have the tags on them from clearly the dealer who is selling African objects to people coming to Africa on like tourism because it like plainly describes like this is this people's and this is what this is and this is so I am I am not married to shed sticks I'm not married to this is something that was shed stick like that was then made into a decorative object it's entirely possible so you know, when we record these in our inventory, um, you get the question mark in parentheses behind the object name because it, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. Yeah, amazing. Um, so I had said two questions, which would mean that there were, there would be one more question, but I see, I'm gonna just, um, I'm gonna take this, there's, here's an additional question, if you don't mind, sure. Jade. Um, and it's a question about, you know, the relationship between the collection at Jefferson and the Museum of Fabrics and Textiles in town. And I'm not quite sure what museum that might be. I know there's a great collection at Drexel of, of costume and textiles and a great collection at the Philadelphia Museum of Art of costume and textiles. So I, I think the question is about what relationships exist between the different costume and textile collections in in Philadelphia. 
Yeah, I mean, we are in Philadelphia so blessed to have such a wide array of museums, just number one, and, and then museums that have specific costume and textile collections. And you mentioned the big ones, like Drexel, of course, has a great collection. The PMA has a great collection. Moore College has a great collection of historic textiles. And then I know, um, and we have a lot of the people who are listening in today, um, that um, the Fabric Workshop and Museum um, has a, a wonderful programming that, as their name suggests, often has to do with fabric and textiles. And we, in fact, have um, worked with them in the past, um, and they, in an exhibition they had of um, featuring the work of Anne Hamilton, um, had a number of our objects from our collection on show. So thank you, Fabric Workshop. Um, but I will just say that, um, you know, we, we uh, as I mentioned, we, we don't exhibit our, our, our things too often, or if we do, it's on a very small scale. But one of the things that um, I'm sort of dipping my toe into trying to maybe make happen more often are these collaborations with other institutions, because why not draw on the um, wonderful things that they have um, and be able to, you know, so for instance, as an example of this, um, I was contacted by the curator at the Drexel costume collection. They're doing a show um, about the 1920s. And they said, uh, do you have a pair of uh, beach pajamas from the 1920s? And I went and pulled <laughs> <laughs> I went and pulled our beach pajamas and I took photo and I sent them and she said those are beautiful we'll take them right so um so we love to get our stuff out there we have and if um after this after we all go to Woodmere Art Museum we all want to take a trip up to um, New York City and go to um oh my gosh the name of the museum I forget but we have it'll come to me in a moment um we have our um a piece at a, a museum in New York City um, on display there. So we relish the opportunity to collaborate with other institutions and organizations. All right, so this is going to be the last question, and it's a question from me, and Jade, I hope you don't mind, but I have been staring at your shirt, and um, in answering some of the questions just a little bit earlier, you kind of raised your hand and you showed more of the shirt which looks amazing. And I wonder if you can tell us what it is. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, I am a, a fan of patterns, as you probably are. <laughs> um, this, uh, my necklace is a, um, it's, it's called, it's, it's kind of a nut um, and it's oh. sliced yeah. in half. Or in really small uh, we sell those at the museum store at Woodmere. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah, then my shirt, great. My shirt here, um, I mean, so you all have heard a little bit about my background in theater. Um, Judy Adamson, if you're still here, she's my graduate uh, professor at my graduate um, program. Um, I made my shirt. She taught me most of what I know about making things. Oh, wow. And, um, and then just a, a sweater with, um, a knit sweater with a lot of patterns because it's a little cold. Uh, I'm coming to <laughs> London, North Carolina, and uh, so have my little sweater on. So lots of patterns. Very cool. Well, I think that with that, um, I want to thank you again, Jade. I want to thank all of your colleagues at Jefferson. I want to thank uh, Hildy at Woodmere for making the connection, Sigrid, um, and all of our other wonderful docents and friends and members at Woodmere for joining us this afternoon. I would say this was a huge success and it um, pushes us to um, do this more often. <laughs> Let's do it. And um, I enjoyed it immensely. It's a nice way to be together. I've seen so many names of so many friends in the list of people you know, participating. And so that warms my heart and makes me want to say that I hope we can see each other again soon and be together. Um, but until then, I thank you for joining us today. And again, um, I'm going to see if I can hit my reaction <laughs> button. And, you know, I'm going to say applause again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jade. And everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, Phil. Thank you. Bye-bye.